Et bonjour Fabienne. Bonjour Fabienne. Bonjour Yann. Okay. Bonjour Kasia. Ok. Ok. Uh, so we uh, we start our next uh, uh, urban intergroup now, urban events, uh, uh, and to, today is about a very very interesting and important uh, initiative. Uh, I I just won't say the mission, but I think it will be explained. But I would like first uh, to give the floor to our vice president of the urban intergroup, um, uh, Madame Fabienne Keller. Uh, uh, many uh, of you uh, uh, know the uh, Fabienne, who used to be the uh, mayor of Strasbourg, next the minister, and now uh, a very important person in the European Parliament. So I'm very honored that we have a chance to talk with her. Fabienne, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jan. That's nice of you. Uh, yes, we are all uh, gathered um, with this common objective. Uh, how can cities uh, uh, help to, to get to that uh, target of ca carbon neutrality in 2050. And may I say that, that I think uh, mayors are working on that subject for years uh, already, but it's a very ambitious target. So uh, the question for us at the European level is to how can we help, how can we, can we be more efficient to support all the ambitious um, investments and actions that are delivered by the mayors and the cities. Uh, so this is the subject of our uh, seminar and the, Jan uh, is our president of the urban group. Uh, as we, you know, in the European Parliament, we try to make a lobby of the cities to carry that lobby. And we have this uh, uh, important green deal where the European Union has set uh, very ambitious targets, carbon neutrality by 2050 and minus 55% by 2030s. Uh, cities have also the central role to play. Um, cities represent only 4% of European uh, Union's territory, but they host 75% of the population. So cities are the places where we have about 70% of CO2 emissions. So this is why uh, if we want to achieve carbon neutrality, we will help, have to help cities to finance them. As you know, for example, the recovery plan, uh, Jan is uh, very, very involved in the budget uh, negotiations and he was involved last year in the recovery plan negotiations. He knows how, how much we are ready to invest helping the cities to get together to that uh, target. This is a challenge, of course, as we know at the end of the COP26 for the planet. A challenge also for urban residents who are daily victims of urban pollution. Uh, in, in France, I don't know the figure in, in Europe, but in France, we estimate that it's 14,000 people uh, who are dying early losing several months of life because of air pollution in the city. 40,000 people, that's huge. So we must help cities to provide a better living environment, a cleaner air, less congestion, and less noise also. It's a very important source of pollution for people. So uh, I am very pleased to open this uh, uh, seminar, EU mission on climate neutral and smart cities. This is one of the five missions created by the Commission and to the new MFF to provide concrete solutions to Europe's biggest challenges. This mission will accompany, but we will have a presentation of that, 100 cities in Europe with the aim of making them smart and climate neutral by 2030 and examples for other European cities, we must act as close as possible to the territories. I can test, give my testimony on that because good ideas are everywhere and we do not necessarily replicate them, but they help uh, finding the right solutions for each specific uh, area, each specific uh, city. So uh, I may suggest, of course, the issues of transport. We love cycling in Strasbourg but also public transportation, collective, uh, co-sharing, for example. Uh, there is the issue of congestion charges, an interesting issue, but 
that's very unpopular. Uh, the issue of low emission zones uh, is of course difficult to implement, but very efficient in terms of uh, results. Some other solutions uh, and ideas may emerge for the future. So I'm sure that all we can share today will help uh, all our networks to uh, share good practices and action because the only way to get to our targets is to implement uh, actions on the ground. So thank you to all of you to be with us uh, today. And uh, I give back the floor to, to Jan for, to conduct the discussion with the presentation of this EU mission on climate neutral and smart cities that uh, the commission has organized. Jan. Yes, um, uh, thank you, Fabian. And uh, thank you for making the introduction. And now uh, we are entering into the uh, presentation of this EU mission. The, uh, we have uh, two, two persons uh, coming from this uh, 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 special uh, team, uh, one who represents the mission board and the, um, and the, uh, the mission manager. Um, uh, as far as concerns the board, I have the honor and pleasure to, to introduce Madame Gronkiewicz Wals, who, as we talked just before our meeting, he, uh, who used to be the first woman president of Warsaw and first uh, the president of the National Bank. So I think, uh, and, and by the way, uh, it, it, it's not the question that this is, that she's a woman, but she's the best to, to have the position. So I think that's why it's, it's, it's important to, 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 to mention this. So I uh, really very, I'm very honored to uh, being from Poland that the former president of Warsaw is with us. But now she's chair of the mission board for the city's mission. So, Madam President, uh, <coughs> Professor, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jan. We know each other for uh, all, almost 25 years, so it means that uh, thank you very much for this good introduction. Um, on behalf of the mission board, I would like to say that we are extremely happy that the Commission has taken the mission board concept and largely implemented it. Uh, as the former mayor of Warsaw, I hope that the implementation of the mission concept improve the situation of cities because they will be able to attract the best innovative companies, young dynamic workforce and to attract new finance flows. What is the difference between previous EU funded projects uh, for the cities and this one of our mission? Uh, a number of EU programs um, are almost uh, most US sectoral, uh, not so much, not holistic, not uh, innovative strategy aiming at climate neutrality per se. Innovation in all senses of the world needs to be placed at the center of the work with cities in becoming climate neutral, including to ensure that full value is drawn from the past on one hand and ongoing basic research programs that action can be scaled up and disseminated to other cities. I will, I will tell you a little bit the why, why 100 cities, but we hope that it will be disseminated for the rest of the cities, which altogether, according with the OECD, we have 800 cities. Um, the city's mission will also focus on delivering greater synergies and complementaries with the other EU programs helping cities to deliver on the twin objectives of the mission. We have these two objectives which are written in, the, in our report, is to reach this goal, uh, 100 European uh, cities uh, uh, on uh, 2030, which, which will be uh, climate neutral, neutral. And the second goal is the dissemination of this program. Uh, the previous projects have considered a variety of objectives, such as improving, for example, the standard of transport vehicles, building clean facilities. We have only one goal, to achieve climate neutrality in 100 European smart cities till 2030. And each project should aim at achieving this goal by means of innovative methods, and it should be achieved by pooling different resources of different origin, public, private, regional, central budget, and of course, EU. 
we believe that uh, in 2030, this goal will be reached in a large area of, as I mentioned, at least 100 European cities. Um, what is new? The central focus for cities seeking to become climate neutral cities by 2030 will be the climate city contract. We call it CCC, climate city contract. And the initial phase of work will be centered on helping cities develop these contracts because it's a new instrument. The CCC are planned to be non-binding in the form of a memorandum of understanding signed by the cities themselves. Use of the phrase contract is intended to indicate a clear political commitment on the part of the city to its citizens, but uh, in the broader also institutional context, the support for the development of the contract by the European national and regional authorities, and it should be also visibly communicated. The CCC will encompass a range of other activities, including setting up large-scale EU uh, research and inno innovation demonstrators, establishing innovative models for city governance and citizens' engagement, tailor-made investment plans for cities, and also the mission label. I hope that Omasi will tell a little bit more about this. This, I want only to mention this new instrument and why it is now, uh, it will be very important. Uh, what is very important, I think, is that our mission is very helpful for the main project of the EU, which is Green Deal. Uh, what will happen in the cities should help all other actors to mobilize and show that the goals set up in the Green Deal are realistic and feasible, because there are so many discussions, there are so many doubts, is it feasible, is it realistic? So we can discover it after our after eight years, because if we can deliver in eight years, our project, Hold You Up For Sure, can deliver in the following 20 years. And why 100 cities? Because we need to, to build a critical mass uh, that will uh, subsequently disseminate uh, all, I think, all uh, over the EU and create a gravity for all the cities so nobody left is left behind. So um, I think that uh, many issues will be of the purpose and direction in which cities should develop. It demands the openness from the cities, from the regional center government, as well from the commission, because for the commission, it's also a new instrument. So thank you. Unfortunately, I have to leave today. I have to go to the university. I have a lecture afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, Professor, and, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for this introduction and the, explaining us what, what it's all, all about. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, Matthew Baldwin, who is the uh, mission uh, manager. And, uh, but starting, uh, Matthew, if you, uh, while presenting the uh, your mission, if you can uh, uh, give us the uh, uh, clear explanation what the, uh, the, the mission is about. Why? Because when we speak about the Green Deal, very often we underline the, the word green, but in fact, uh, this is a, it should be a deal. So, uh, 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 so it's not something which can be imposed or uh, suggested. They said, no, this is a kind of a deal. So the, uh, the, the missions, if you can please start to infer, in, and inform us, maybe for some of us it's absolutely obvious, but I think it can be very useful to, to explain us what it really means in European terminology to have the mission. I mean, the, uh, uh, to, to what, what it really means comparing to un, the, the other activities uh, uh, of the commission. So first, what it really means, the mission, and next, uh, what about uh, our mission we are talking about? So, Matthew, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jan. Um, it's great to be with you today in the intergroup. Uh, um, it's, it's really an honor, actually, because if, if, if cities, my theory is that cities are the crossroads where the 
policies of the European Green Deal meet the people. And if that's right, the intergroup is the crossroads where the European Parliament meets urban policy in all its different aspects. So the chance to present to you, given the, the, the width of your coverage, uh, is, is, is really a great honour. And of course, it's also an honour to follow two of the great European mayors that we've had, um, Madame Keller and my great friend, Professor Hanna Gronkovic. And uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm full of flowers today, to, <laughs> if I may begin. But your question, Jan, is exactly the right one. And maybe we can flip up the first slide. Um, it's, it's actually, sorry, back one, that's it. Um, thank you, Alexandra. Uh, this slide actually summarizes a number of the elements that Madame Keller and, and, and Professor Gronkovic have already touched on. But you're right to begin with the Green Deal. It's exactly the backdrop, the context for everything we're trying to achieve here. And I also like what you said, it has to be green, but it also has to be a deal. And the catchphrase for the mission board report, which as Hannah said, we've picked up and run with and implemented very largely, was with and for the citizens. If the Green Deal feels like it's being posed on the citizens rather than being done with them and by them, it will find it much harder to achieve that. Um, so the, we're right to have these very high ambitions. Um, we've tested the Fit for 55 package. We know it can be implemented and therefore we must implement it, in, implement it if we are to save the planet and to maintain Europe's leadership in climate change. But what was fascinating for me going to Glasgow was the sense that globally we're starting to move from a period of negotiation into a period of implementation. And if you like the city mission or action urban in urban areas generally can be the vital micro action to implement the macro objectives of the European Green Deal. And indeed, of course, everything we're trying to achieve in the, in the global context. And in Glasgow, the mayors were everywhere. The mayors were providing for me, and maybe I was just looking to talk to mayors, but uh, the vital glue for what we're trying to achieve on climate change, not just in Europe, by the way, although our focus is rightly on Europe, but, but globally. I, I had the honor to meet the mayor of Ouagadougou and uh, the, 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 the energy and the drive that these guys are, are bringing to the climate change agenda, both on mitigation, which is the subject we're talking about today, but also on adaptation is so exciting and so tangible and so real, and we've got to tap into it. Um, but in, in this consensual way, uh, as I said. So this, this, this slide, I won't go through the points because some of them have been made so well and more eloquently by others, but just go back a second, one more time to it, if you, if you would. The question posed very well by Madame Keller, I think, is whether, are we too ambitious? And I think Hannah answered it. If we're too ambitious, then we may be too ambitious generally on climate change. And I'm talking to mayors just in the last city just in the last week to Marseille, to Saragossa, to Mannheim. And these are three very different but big industrial cities and they have the ambition to go for 2030. And we want this infection, if you like, to spread across the EU. And we want to have so many different mayors and cities coming forward. Um, next slide, please. You asked me to present, Jan, and I'm very proud to be able to do so, the, the crucial elements. And, the notion of the missions is that we go with concrete objectives, we spell them out up front. I think that's an important and visible part of what we're trying to do. And here they are. We want to have at least 100 climate neutral and smart European cities by 2030. I won't talk a lot today for interests of time on the smart element, but for me, it's a key driver. I don't think a city can achieve climate neutrality by 2030 without being smart in the sense of digital and data driven in all aspects of its work, it goes without saying. But the second objective there is also vital because these first 100 cities can only be the vanguard. And what we need is for these cities, and this is why it's a Horizon Europe project with innovation at its very heart. These cities need to act as the experimentation and the innovation hubs to put all European cities in a position to become climate neutral by 2050. Back to the big picture. We need to ensure that all cities can be climate neutral by 2050 because the whole continent needs to be there. And we need to exploit the leadership potential that cities can bring, the ambition and the leadership potential together. And there's just another quick reminder, if we needed it, of, of what, uh, what um, Madame Keller already mentioned, the, the massive and visible co-benefit. She mentioned the air quality, 40,000 in France, 500,000 people across the EU. 
um, less road congestion, more livable spaces. Road deaths, not on that list. 70% um, of the people who die in our cities are vulnerable road users. And uh, we have to change that. We have to create more livable spaces for all transport users. Um, and and uh, so I, I will stop my ranting on, but those are the two key objectives in mind. Next slide, please. Um, Hannah's touched on these, but I think it's useful just to put them up on a slide for you in concrete forms. And Kasia, if you agree, perhaps you'd, uh, you would agree to circulate these slides to, to every, all the participants, because I think that would be useful for them. The two elements there, are, are, are flag, and I'll talk about more about those in a moment, but look just at some of the elements here. The mission label will be very important. Uh, all the cities that have a climate city contract will have, uh, I, I'd like to have actually a literal label, a badge that says we are a climate neutral city. And hopefully that will unlock better access to the structural funds, better access to funds coming through the recovery and resilience facility, better access to all EU programs, better access access to national programs. Um, cannot underestimate how important it will be to have national support for the cities that are doing this. If you like, the cities are taking the burden of climate mitigation on their backs. They need that support um, and will be working with national governments to achieve that. Um, uh, once again, this is RI action. We're bringing a lot of money from Horizon Europe to this, around 300 million euros in the first, in the first period. That will be part of our Horizon Europe work program. Um, uh, and also we're giving some money to, and I'll say a word about it in the mission platform, they will be spending more money on r &I action to do the deep demonstrator projects, which I think will be very exciting for the cities that are engaged in them and the cities that can learn from them. I've talked already about the citizens engagement. That means innovative city governance models, not because the commission says so, or the commission thinks we know how to do it. Cities know how to do it. We'd love to learn from you and share that experiences that cities already have about how to do citizens engagement in the context of climate neutrality. Um, next slide, please. And so just in a bit more detail, these essential contracts. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the timetable at the end, but just to kind of understand how this would work mechanically, we will launch our call for expression of interest, we hope on the 25th of November next week. It's gonna be a busy period till then. And that will be the moment when cities can come forward and say, OK, yeah, we're interested in this. And the chosen 100 cities will then be working with the mission platform, about which more in a moment, to develop these climate city contracts. Hannah mentioned a number of the elements, but these are bottom up, city driven, city owned, city led, tailor made plans on how to reach climate neutrality. Non legally binding in the sense that we're not going to be taking cities to court if they can't deliver on the objectives, but they're the the guiding, the guiding rail for all the actions that need to be done. And once again, co-created with the involvement of national authorities and regions, local stakeholders, and again, including citizens and local economic actors. That's the message which is so clear from cities like Leuven just down the road, who've done it absolutely piece by piece with the citizens. And again, it needs that signature from the mayor, but the mayors are already engaged, are already leading. Next slide, please. Um, we are the new kid on the block. I think one of the things we have to show is that we add value to uh, the panoply of different uh, European programs uh, for cities. And the key thing here is we're not trying to say out of our way, we're going to take over all of this stuff. We want to synergize very actively with them. Uh, we've had terrific cooperation with the folks in the uh, covenant of the mayors. We want to support the climate pact as it begins its work. Um, I'm, I'm not listing them all here, but we are working closely with the Living in the U program. Uh, with the Green City Accords, uh, with the Zero Pollution Action Plans, because again, precisely, our cities will be able to address each and every one of these elements. The advantage for the cities, if you like, is that by, by participating in our mission, we hope they'll have improved access to these other programs, and indeed we'll be supporting these other programs through, through our cities. I mentioned the mission label, and again, I mentioned the national networks. This has to be a complement, a complementary activity to the existing things that are going on. We do believe it's very ambitious and very innovative and it has a huge potential, but we're not trying to uh, take over other people's work. Next slide, please. So I mentioned I give you the timetable. It's often so important to be able to see how this maps out. And with your permission, Jan, I'd love to be able to come back and debrief the urban intergroup whenever you'd like me to come to tell you how we're getting on and to hear your comments and criticisms about the process. 
Um, we have published in October our comprehensive information kit for cities to help them prepare. Um, Pre-registrations are already open. We've well over 100 cities that have already pre-registered. Um, we will open our call uh, in November. On the November the 25th is our target date. Um, it could slip by a couple of days because these things sometimes happen. But this is going to give cities around um, uh, uh, around two and a half months, we hope, uh, to really prepare this call. We're trying, we're working very hard to make the, the call text user friendly. It will be quite detailed. We want to, we want to get a lot of information about uh, the potential participating cities, but uh, we're trying to make it as user friendly as possible. We're then, I hope, going to have a very difficult task of choosing the participating cities by the end of March, but the mission platform will begin its work uh, uh, as of, um, well, it says here mid-2022, I hope uh, in the second quarter of 2022. I said I was going to say more about the mission platform. It's one of the most exciting elements, um, again, to help drive forward uh, in an innovative way our processes. It's formed by the Net Zero Cities Consortium, a new consortium of many names that will be very familiar to you. It's led by EIT Climate Kick, uh, with close support from EuroCities and ICLE, with 30 other organizations with great expertise in all the aspects of what it takes to be climate neutrality. We have energy cities, resilient cities, all the guys who've been involved in urban mobility, such as Ruprecht Consult. We've got people who are specialists in finance for cities from the Frankfurt School of Finance, from Bankers Without Boundaries, because so much of this is going to be about helping cities prepare the investment plans to bring in all the money which is out there. And it, believe you me, that's one of the other things I took from Glasgow, just how much money there is to go towards climate neutrality for those that are ready to use it. And, 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 but we'll still need to pull together these, um, these different um, uh, plans as part of the overall climate city contract. Um, so that's a quick snapshot of the process. Um, we will begin work with around 25 to 30 cities under the mission platform. Uh, it's, a, it's a big consortium, it's high powered, but we think that's our, our guesstimate as to how many um, cities the mission platform would be able to handle in this very deep bottom up way. But we are, as part of our um, Horizon at Work program, already launching or going to be launching shortly a call for what we call Mission Platform 2.0, which will bring in the funds to tackle the other 75 or so cities that are selected as part of the first 100. Next slide, please. This is an important uh, issue. Um, we have, we tried to minimize the number of strictly qualifying criteria because we want diversity. And so the strictly the only criteria we're applying is 50,000 minimum population. And even then there is some flexibility. Cities from smaller member states, uh, we might not have that true representativeness. So if you're a small member state with less than five cities of a population of more than 100,000, then we're going to enable cities from those member states to come in between 10 and 50,000. I know that sounds like compli slightly complicated, but it again, it'll help us to explore the diversity. We'll be testing them, we hope, on some of the smaller cities as well as some of the larger cities. And the second qualifying criterion is that the city needs, as I said, to state that it is ready to go all the way in all sectors to achieve climate neutrality by 2030. So then that will leave us with a number of assessment criteria on this call. And I just mentioned some of them here. Again, the level of ambition and preparedness, but not just the usual suspects. It would be relatively easy to take cities from Finland, from Sweden, from Denmark, the Netherlands, the cities have already done a lot of the hard work and thinking, and I congratulate them and I thank them for it, and we want some of them in the mission. But we want cities from the south, from the east, as well as from the north and west of Europe. So we want, as it says there, true geographic diversity. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's why it's exciting, uh, I think, from your perspective, Jan, and from the perspective of Hannah and uh, talking to mayors again from Central Europe, there is genuine interest out there to come in and get the, uh, the assistance that we can, I think, provide through uh, this mission to, to help cities get there. And again, thereby to help their member states achieve this binding European climate targets. And the last thing we really want to see from cities is their ideas. It doesn't have to be fully formed plans of how they're going to engage citizens and stakeholders. Once again, not not the commission saying, you know, with its big wagging finger, this is how you have to do it, but, but saying, explaining to us 
using lots of different examples that already exist, how they plan to do that. And so finally, to the last slide, please. This is how you can get in touch with us. Um, we have, this is our functional mailbox. Uh, we're, we're busy like crazy, but we are really doing our best to reply to every question. Um, there's on our, our webpage, which sets out some of the key elements. It, there you will find uh, Hannah's uh, and her colleagues, a wonderful original mission board report, which if you like is the precursor report driving us forward. You will find our implementation plan, which has now been approved by the commission. You'll find our info kit, and shortly you will find the call for expression of interest. Next events um, coming up, we will have a, a conference on European uh, missions organized by the um, uh, Committee of the Regions on the 25th of November. That will be another chance for us to reach out to a very broad constituency. Uh, we're very grateful for the support, not just of the Parliament, but also the Committee of the Regions. A lot of cities are also regions. And um, I think through our dialogue with them, we've been also able to reassure them that this can be a plus for the broader regional movement as well. Um, and uh, for the cities that are going to be in the program, and they will need the region support. And of course, some cities are also regions, uh, such as Hamburg, such as Ile de France, such as Nantes, Metropole. Uh, so uh, we'll have this conference next week, um, and uh, we're very much looking forward to in engaging with a number of mayors as well. I hope I haven't gone on too long. My enthusiasm for the subject always rather carries me away. Um, but if I could just go to my next slide and say a big thank you once again, Jan, for the chance to uh, explain our, our plans um, uh, here today. I've seen a number of questions in the chat and I'm very happy to engage later on. Thank you very much. What I would like to propose you, uh, Matthew, maybe, maybe you can just react immediately to the chat because next we will have the uh, examples from the cities. And it will be uh, maybe interesting to, to have the answers from you now. Maybe later will be some other other questions. So uh, if you see if you see the chat, please you can just refer refer to this, please. I will do that straight away. To the question from Murat Altonbas, a great question, uh, Mr. Baldwin. That's very nice. You're looking you're talking about unlocking funds. However, it is still unclear what the direct funding would be if selected one of the 100. Could you please clarify this? Thanks. Um, this uh, mission is not intended to be, uh, you know, we're not coming with uh, loaded with money and checks for cities. Um, all the, the, the finance and funding that is needed to get uh, to climate neutrality is going to rely heavily on our ability to suck in external private finance. That said, we will be bringing, as I mentioned earlier, 300 million euros upfront of Horizon Europe money. Some of that will go into the mission platform. A lot of that will find its way directly to the cities through the deep demonstrators that the mission platform through the Net Zero Cities Consortium will be putting together. Again, we hope very much that this mission will mean better access to structural funds, better access to funds coming through the Recovery and Resilience Funds. Um, I can't give you a number, but I'm sure there will be increased funding coming through European and I hope also through national and other sources. Maybe your question is relevant from the other end, which is what is the estimate of the probable cost? Here, I would refer you to a very good study by Material Economics, which estimates the average cost of climate neutrality for a city population size 100,000, so a medium sized European city is around 1 billion euros. So that kind of money, if you multiply that by 100 times or more, if we get bigger cities, is clearly not available to the European budget. The key to our mission success will be unlocking the roads to the external finance, and we are very committed to doing that. Sorry, I'm making it long. Question from Masha Gerwin. Do you know already when exactly the call will be closed? I'm nervous about putting a date on it because until we've launched the call, I think then we have to start to count back from that. But I would say uh, pretty certainly somewhere in the window between the end of January and the first and, and mid February. Um, uh, I hope that's clear. Um, stated ambition. What is the form? Great question from Mr. Bischak. Oh, sorry, maybe it's Mr. I don't know. It might be a message. Um, uh, we want a very clear political statement from the mayor or the governing authorities of the city. And uh, I hope that will be clear when you look at the expression of interest, how we are asking you to express that. We're going to have some free text there, so to enable the city to explain uh, the nature of its ambition, the nature perhaps of the challenges too. Um, but it's in essence, it is a clear statement that the city is ready 
to either develop or tweak its existing plans to get to climate neutrality by, uh, by 2030. Excuse me, I'll just get rid of this. Um, sorry, I hit the wrong button, I'm back. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> um, uh, yes. So the, the next question uh, from, uh, from Ulrich Fickar, um, cooperation with the national authorities for the climate city contract, does it mean that cities need to show the commission an agreement? No, it doesn't. We're conscious that um, cities um, have at the moment very different levels of support from their national authorities. Um, we're very much hoping that that national support emerges from all member states, but it is not a prior criterion to show that the member states support your application, and nor are we asking the member states to choose the cities that come forward. It is for the cities to come forward. Um, I see now six new messages. Uh, do you want to stop me, Jan? Am I going on too long? Uh, 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 no, I, I, uh, if, you pre if you prefer, do you prefer that we first we give the floor to the representative of the cities and next go back to, the, uh, to, to, to you, or do you prefer now to, to answer the, the questions from the chat? Well, I'm, I'm going through them. Uh, let me, if I can go quickly through the other ones. Will there be yeah. other to ask questions? Yes, if I stop now and then we can plug in everybody. <laughs> Another question from, from Masha uh, Gerwin. Uh, can I elaborate more on the smart aspect? Um, I tried to do a short uh, point there because for me, the smart elements are everywhere. They're, they're in the, the integrated technologies needed to deliver on energy demand management. They're, they're everywhere in terms of bringing around sustainable and smart mobility. There's no defined goal here, but we clearly expect to see in the contracts, cities explaining how they are proposing to use the, the quote unquote smart elements. I think that, I hope that makes sense. Again, it's not for the commission to say how smart or, uh, but I, I think it's gonna be very clear. When will the call for expression be open closed? My target date is the 25th of November to be closed somewhere between the end of January and mid February. Um, Charles Carey's point, a notice board for small business uh, interested, great idea. Um, I'll talk about that with the consortium. They're very keen to form little partnerships with, uh, with the private sector. Um, and, and it's important point you raised, the private sector will be elemental to the success of this mission. Again, look at Leuven and how they've involved the private sector. Question from Estelle Paulus, could the population of a city such as a, a public initiative submit an application? Um, I, I think uh, it's an interesting idea. Um, uh, I think it has to come from the mayor. The mayors have to own this, but it, it, implicit in the question is that it, if the mayor can show, show that the population is right behind, I think that will be a very strong signal. Um, Milia Dimitrova, uh, how are cities expected to state their will? Do you need a decision by the city council? I'll, we'll leave that to the cities. If the mayor can express the authority um, uh, on his or her own behalf, um, clearly they'll need to be able to do so safely. And if they need a decision for the city council, that's a question for them. Um, Matteo Sata, regions and group participations. Um, we've covered this in some detail in our frequently asked questions, which I should have mentioned, which again, you can find on our website. Uh, it makes sense in, in, for some cities which are geographically contiguous to apply together, but then it needs to be very clear who is taking the political authority for that. The other issue is uh, what about a city, let's take the example of Paris, which sits in Ile-de-France. Um, could there be an application from Paris? Yes. Could there be an application from Ile-de-France? Yes. Um, but I hope that there will be some discussion between the cities and the regions or the, the, the grander metropolitan regions as to how that would work in practice. We're happy to give some further guidance on that if, if cities would like or regions would like to speak to us. Um, what exactly does the commission commit to in signing the contract? Another question from Masha Gerwin. Well, our commitment is up front in establishing the mission um, and putting forward the funds for that and setting up the, the platform. And it, the commitment is to work every step of the way with the city to help you get to climate neutrality. I hope that's, uh, I hope that's clear. Um, our financial instruments, my goodness, the questions keep coming. I'll do one more. <laughs> our financial instruments and capacity building tools foreseen to support cities and regions directly without going through the member state national level? Um, and if so, what kind of capacity building support? Um, at this stage, we're not uh, able to, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We think cities can get the, 
the necessary starting support both through Horizon Europe and then through the existing EU funding programs, mm -hmm. such as structural funds, using, we hope, the mission label and the support of national authorities to get, um, to get uh, better access to funding. Once again, I don't think cities should approach this thinking we can get all of the money we need for this through European funds because there isn't that much funding in the system to tackle all of that. Um, what happens if cities realize they don't reach the goal? Do they have to fear penalties? Can they cancel the contracts? Um, no penalties will be involved. There is no plan to take cities to court, to recover funds, to do any of those things. We know it's a big undertaking. Um, and we also have to be realistic. We know that you know, some cities will, 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 will maybe come into the program having not started initially, and some cities might drop out. Um, we have to be realistic and pragmatic about it, but the contract doesn't, wouldn't need to be cancelled in that sense. It is a clear undertaking from the commission and it matches an undertaking from the, sorry, from the city and it matches an undertaking from the commission to work with them to get there. Um, cities shouldn't get hung up on the nature of the contract and whether they're going to be somehow sued. The, the, the issue is for me, the city taking that political commitment vis-a-vis -vis its citizens and being able to deliver on it. I think the questions are going faster than my ability to answer them. So I think we should stop to make sure we give time to hear from mayors, um, if that's all right for you, Jan. Um, yeah, but you know, this is, a, <laughs> Matthew, as you, as you notice, this is quite interesting that this is not a uh, business as usual. So the people are speaking, nobody is uh, putting any comments to the chat in country. This is very, very active. Uh, and, we have, me. and we have 125 participants all the time. So well, I guarantee okay. this, Jan, just to interrupt you, sorry, I guarantee you we will answer every one of the questions that is put to us clearly and in, in written form as quickly as possible. So if I don't get to it now, we'll get to it later. Yeah, but <laughs> I okay. really should shut up. I think this is the kind of this is a kind of invitation for everybody to, to put the question. But OK, but Matthew, I, I have now a, a, the, 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 uh, the suggestion to you. You yourself can give the floor to the representative of the cities. And uh, after the presentation, if we have some time, we will be back to some answers. If not, the answers will be made um, on the written form or on your platform, we will see. Okay, so if you please, please take now the, the lead and give the floor to the president, okay? It's Thank very you. Dangerous, very dangerous to have the commission chairing the intergroup, uh, but it's, it won't be a, a precedent, I guarantee you. Um, thank you for your patience and for your questions and uh, for your interest. And I can feel the excitement and enthusiasm coming through the chat. Let me, without any further ado, pass the floor, if I may, to, to Philip Rosma, who we've known already to many of you. Of course, he's the vice mayor of the city of Groningen in the Netherlands. Philip, good morning. Yeah. Over to you. Good morning, uh, Matthew. Thank you for uh, for uh, uh, for uh, allowing us to give this uh, presentation. My name is uh, Philip Bruxma. Indeed, I'm the vice mayor of uh, the city of Groningen, which is a, a medium-sized city, and I'm uh, responsible for uh, energy and mobility and ICT. So when you're talking about climate neutral and smart cities and about livable spaces and air pollution and traffic, uh, it's all in my uh, responsibility area. Um, uh, if I can have the next slide, then you'll see where Groningen is uh, located. It is in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, you could also say it's uh, south of the North Sea. It's uh, 230,000 uh, inhabitants. And uh, uh, on the next slide, it's, it's a combination of an, it's an, a medieval city, but also uh, uh, new architectural buildings. And this is this building, the Forum, as it's called, elected the, the most beautiful building in the Netherlands, uh, the new most beautiful new building in the Netherlands of last year. Um, we have more bicycles than inhabitants, so talking about, uh, about, uh, about traffic, about mobility. 1.4 bicycle per inhabitant. And um, uh, we are an ambitious city in many different areas, like ICT, like mobility, like energy, and like health. And we are proud of our innovative ecosystem. We have two renowned universities. We have 80,000 students from all over the world. We have a big startup scene um, and various businesses in various areas. And uh, uh, well, we believe that energy transition can only be successful if we approach it in an integrated way. So that therefore we need to include all relevant uh, stakeholders. Um, 
And on the next slide, you'll see uh, uh, our ambition. Um, our ambition for carbon neutrality is in 2035, which is 15 years 15 years ahead of uh, the national and the, the EU goals of 2050. And in Groningen, we feel the urgency. And it's, uh, you may know that Groningen is a, a part where natural gas is uh, mined and uh, we, we, we suffer from earthquakes. So we don't have to explain to people here why we should stop with fossil uh, energy sources, why we should stop with mining for natural gas. Um, the ambition to be carbon neutral by 2030 35, we have it since uh, 2011, and we want all energy used within the borders of the municipality must stem from sustainable uh, sources. It's an integrated ambition. Um, it's also about mobility, also about climate adaptation, also about the social domain. It's all interconnected. It's not only a technical uh, change, it's also a social change, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, it's not uh, not just uh, beneficial to the climate and to the planet, but it's also should be beneficial to every single uh, inhabitant and, and the society as a whole. Um, when we're looking at the carbon emissions in the municipality, we see that one of the main uh, challenges lie within the uh, built environments. You see, you have 56 percent is gebouwen, uh, which is buildings. And uh, on the next slide, you'll see that we have made this heating systems map. We call it our starting uh, bid. Um, that's uh, how we start the, the discussions with our inhabitants. Uh, in red, you'll see a heating, a district heating uh, system. In blue, it will be all electric. And green, it's more the, the, the rural area, the, uh, the outskirts of the, uh, of the city in which we think a hybrid system, uh, green gas and electric is there, um, uh, is uh, appropriate in those systems. You also see um, in the last, in 2030, so free from natural gas, carbon neutral in 2030. And this is um, a, a well-established uh, policy. It's in full agreement with the uh, with the local politics, and it's been our policy since 2011, and which is confirmed every uh, single time. Actually, last week we still had a discussion. Uh, uh, next week we'll have a discussion, and we'll have um, uh, an established uh, policy. Maybe on the next slide, uh, you will see that um, um, that we have uh, on the right hand side. And the, the picture is the roadmap we have. Uh, the route car, the roadmap to this carbon neutrality in 2035, which means that in large parts of the city will speed up. And you'll see uh, the, what, what I just mentioned in 2030, we're free from natural gas. So carbon neutral by 2030, which is a huge part of the, uh, of the city. Um, we have two main areas of focus, which is the energy production or heat production. And the second one, of course, the heat demand reduction, which actually um, is, uh, is the first one, because if, the, if you don't need heat, you don't have to produce it either. So uh, the heat demand reduction is on insulation, which also, also gives a more, a more comfortable uh, 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 houses, more easier, uh, nicer to live in, but it also uh, reduces the heat demand. And the first one, the energy heat production, is a combination of, um, of solar power and uh, wind, uh, wind, wind power, uh, wind energy, and uh, uh, the sustainable energy sources that we want to uh, uh, establish within our uh, municipality. Um, the main, main challenges for heat demand reduction is um, the building owners. We cannot force it upon um, um, building owners. Uh, they, uh, at the end of the day, they have to make the decision to insulate their houses and place heat pumps or connect to the district heating. And we, we, uh, we take a proactive role in uh, supporting uh, those, um, those uh, people, those house owners, the owners of the buildings. And uh, also effective public participation is pivotal. And we also, uh, it, we stress that no citizens be left behind. There will be no cherry picking, like um, say so we want to do it in public hands. And energy poverty, as we call it, is an important issue in Groningen. Um, we see energy prices rising, and those people who do not have the means 
uh, uh, or the, the ability to in, increase their mortgage or to have uh, the savings, enough savings to, to, um, uh, to insulate their houses, they will be prone to rising energy prices. And exactly those are the groups that you don't want to be left, left behind. Those who can afford to insulate their houses and to reduce the, their heat demand or energy demand they will um, find their way. We'll support them and we have all the, all the energy to, to help them. But those who cannot uh, um, uh, have, who do not have the financial means, um, uh, that, is a, that is a big issue. And we want to counter that as well. Uh, what, um, uh, we, won't, won't want, we do not want this to lead, that the energy transition leads to a division between the haves and the have-nots for those who can um, uh, insulate and those who cannot insulate. So that is an important uh, thing. Uh, on the next slide, um, uh, we say effective public participation is something, uh, it's, it's, it's the key of our, of our uh, policy. It's important to include the citizens from the beginning, from the start, and give them agency. Uh, as I said, the energy transition is not purely a technical transition, but also a social one. And we need to listen to our citizens and important that the process be honest and trustworthy. And it's also an integrated approach. You cannot go to the citizens and talk only about energy as they have other social problems, as they have a problem, may have problems with mobility, as they may have problems with their, with their health. So it is bottom up, it is with the citizens, for the citizens. And we do not want to, as I sometimes call it, force happiness upon them. Like we say, we know what makes you happy. No, we do it bottom up together with the citizens. To give an example, when we talk about energy, uh, had the energy transition and the, and the carbon neutrality, uh, I sometimes get the question, do I need new pots and pans for cooking? That are the questions that, 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 that are important for the people. And you don't hear it from the, from the city hall when you, when, when you would try to force it upon them. Hey, we know what's good for you. We know what makes you happy. No, we need to do it from bottom up. They will ask, is it, will, it, will it work? Hey, just take heating, will it work? Will there still be uh, hot water from the shower? Uh, is it, how is it financially? And is it for the next 10, 20, no, 30 or 40, 50 years? And um, is it worth the while? But they also ask, do we need pots, new pots and pans for cooking? So that's the uh, range of questions we hear. And it's the range of, of doubts and, and questions people have. And that's why it's important to do it bottom up. Um, when I, uh, our reaction to the uh, to the proposal of the 100 climate neutral cities, uh, yes, we've been involved uh, uh, earlier since you first heard, first heard about it, the mission two years ago. We are enthusiastic, and Groningen is eager to become one of the 100 climate neutral cities, smart cities. We will definitely hand in our um, expression of interest, um, and we are convinced that this mission can speed up and boost the realization of our journey towards, uh, towards uh, carbon neutrality. So it fits with our uh, uh, established plan. So the political support is, is huge within the city of Groningen. Um, Tailor-made investment plans, mission platform are essential for us to, to, uh, to achieve our goals. Sufficient funding for cap capacity building is also essential. Um, in order to reach our, our target, more capacity is uh, uh, pivotal in terms of enabling effective public participation. We, uh, I just told you it's at the, uh, at the core of our uh, endeavors, at the core of our, uh, our, uh, our plans, uh, the public participation essential, otherwise it will not work. And also because it's more than just an energy transition, it's more than just that. And so we also have to broaden our team working on carbon neutrality to to, to help and support our citizens, uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, districts to, to, to make the change. Uh, we also think that this energy transition is a shared responsibility. We cannot do it on our own as a local authority. Um, support from national government is crucial next to individual citizens, citizens next to the private sector. Uh, but we need national government uh, support financially uh, in terms of adapting laws and regulation. Uh, since our ambition for the city as a whole is 2035 and for big parts of the city um, is, will be 2030 earlier because we, we, um, we have feel the urgency. Um, um, 
because one of the questions I have, so I had to, to get to get all people uh, go with this. So what do I tell citizens? Let's say if they are now currently 50 years of age and uh, can I tell them your turn is in 2050? That is when you are age 79, then it's your turn. No, we cannot tell them, tell that. And what, um, what do I tell citizens who do not possess the financial means for the transition? Um, and will this lead to a division between the haves and the have nots? And can we speed up? And that's what we want we, for the sake of our children, for the sake of our grandchildren. Can we organize it financially such that that division between the haves and the have nots does not uh, take place? So if the, if the haves and the have nots, um, if there's a division, we have a social, be a social disaster, but we also, we as a whole, we will not reach our carbon goals if the have nots cannot participate. So we need everyone to participate as soon as possible and the urgency is felt throughout our city. Uh, that was my presentation. Thank you for so far. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Philippe. I see Fab Fabienne, Madame Keller, you're still here. Would you like to take over the chairing, which might be more appropriate? Oh, no, 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 no. I love it when the commission is under control of the parliament. <laughs> no, no. I, I just want to thank my, uh, my colleague, uh, the, the mayor of uh, Groningen. It's so nice to see how important it is to have, you know, um, concrete uh, experience and questions of people like the issue of eating. Of course, it's essential uh, for our citizens. Yeah. And maybe say also that we have very positive forces because people want to participate to carbon neutrality. And it's a great push. They not only think about you know, the COP26 uh, goals, etc. No, they each of them want to be part of this uh, effort and to this uh, change of habits to be able to say, I am participating because my you know, my young children are, are talking about it because it's important for the planet, etc. So I think cities is a nice place where political objectives and operational actions are together. But the thing is, how do we put this in a more global, as we do in your city, Mr. Bruxma, uh, in a global uh, objective so that we are part of something that's bigger than us and that make a good result for the city as a whole and that we can see that we can share that we can uh, be proud of or how, how we can identify uh, uh, subjects where we can improve usually traffic congestion or uh, the quality of air is is a goal still to be worked on so thank you for your testimony and maybe we can open the floor to open other people if I think there's one Please. more one more planned contribution, uh, if I may, Madame Keller, to come from uh, from Antonio Miguel uh, Castro. So uh, I'd like to give him the floor. If I may just say, I can't resist. I'm such a talkative person today. I love what you just said. I think that expressed it so well. Um, but the, you can have multiple motivations to go for climate neutrality. And that's yeah. the joy of the co-benefit. In other words, you know, it might be that your children are, are, are thinking about you know, their children and, and, and how we can make the planet safe for future generations. But right now, we can get that better air quality. Right now, we can tackle the congestion. I'm asked by my friends in the cycling community, well, all these plans are great, but where's the commission saying that cities have to come with a cycling plan? Uh, for climate neutrality. We do have one. We well, do I'm have sure one. you do, Philippe, you know, and I'm sure you have as well, Fabian. But the point is that you can't do these kinds of things without engaging in cycling or walking or whatever it is. You don't need the commission's top-down diktat to do that. It's yeah. going to happen d'office in, in its own spirit. So, and this is why I think this is such an exciting project because it pulls so many things along with it. Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Yeah. It's really wrong. And, as, and I have to be under the control of the parliament, as Madame Keller has said. Um, shall I we control you, Mr. Baldwin. Shall we go to Antonio <laughs> Castro before I make any more diplomatic errors? Antonio, I think the floor is yours. Hello, Matthew. Uh, you said important things, so uh, I love to, to listen to you. So um, just to start, thank you very much. Um, 
It is a great pleasure that I address this conference in this morning um, in here in Gaia. Uh, it, will, it will be better to be together, uh, but it is what it is. So I'm truly excited about the presentation of UA mission on climate neutral and smart cities of uh, Professor Anna, for Matthew and the Vice President Philip. And on behalf of the municipality of Gaia, uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. And just to start, and of course, with this important declaration of interest that, that, that I want to share, uh, that resume uh, our reaction as a city, is that we are truly committed, uh, the mayor, the vice mayor, the presidents of the public companies, we have two, one from the one public company for water and one public company for the urban planning and smart cities, the, the Gayur. And so we are uh, committed to the success of the future in the mission of climate neutral and smart cities of our city and our citizens. And we intend to accept the deal. Villa Nova de Gaia is just to, to, to make a picture, a medium size, uh, a European medium size. It's the third largest Portuguese city with more than 300,000 inhabitants. It's the most populous in the North region. It's five times larger in area than Porto, our most known neighbors and a center of intensive econ economic and cultural activity. For example, we have more than 33,000 companies in here. We have the biggest company of bikes in Europe, in Gaia. We have a manufacturer of hydrogen buses. And so uh, we have an ecosystem with potential in mobility and energy that can help and support uh, as we have to the universities and investigation centers, of course. Cities are the place where decarbonization strategy for energy, transport, buildings, industry, and even agriculture and food systems coexist and intersect. Gaia 2030 agenda supports an European smart climate neutral, democratic and sustainable city with a way for social innovation, low carbon development, green, blue, and circular, circular economy solutions. We are committed to implement for, of a circular economy as building block of our local strategy. And the challenge now is to identify opportunities and guidelines to support and promote the acceleration towards 2030 and fostering the climate neutrally of the city. We are also uh, developing several projects with the aim to achieve a sustainable urban development, implementing some living lives in the city, promoting the experimentation and co-creation of innovation, uh, innovative solutions, developing policies that favor more environmental friendly measures, planning in order to reduce the impact of the city activity, to mitigate the effects of climate change, changes, and to improve the quality of life of citizens. In Gaia, we want to go through this process and we have an internal task force working from the municipality and from the public companies, from the investigation test centers, stakeholders. And so we have to prepare ourselves to the challenge. We have to look back and learn about, learn with our mistakes and learn with some good examples and look, look forward trying to prepare to the future with good public policies on this path towards carbon neutrality. We are uh, avoiding uh, the vision in silos, departments or in slots. This type of vision doesn't communicate isn't collaborative. We are not solidary with the problems and with the people. We don't learn, or at least we don't accelerate learning. And this type of vision don't create real impact in our communities. We have two transversal and fundamental axes, strength knowledge in sustainable areas. And the second one, 
empowering and involving citizens. And we start to doing that in our local plan uh, revision. And this transversal axis allow a long term a new perspective to achieve the city transformation, but keeping tradition and customs. We are involved to build bridges between people. It's our approach and methodology to grow, create synergies, create a critical mass to learn and accelerate this transition. And I think that today, this conference is important to understand this new opportunity. And for us, Gaia, important to understand where we start, where we are at the moment, and want, where we want to go. And this type of sharing that we are making today help us in the way of the future. We are in the community where we cannot be, we are in a time of, we are in a time as a community where we cannot be afraid to take risks and innovate. Uh, I think that we be afraid of innovation of technology in trying to involve the citizens to participate is what destroys and put cities in stagnation, grow and development. The success of a city, like I or another one, is, it, is the way that we interpret the signs, the singularities of the moment, finding the form and the method, and then passing the message, this important message to move to, move to climate neutral and smart cities, and pass this message to people, to companies, to startups, to institutions, to the schools, because we need to involve them to support and design a city, an inclusive city, a better place to live. And all we do is this, in our governance, in our local governance, in the governance of Gaia, allow people to get closer, to participate with different points of views and create more and more social value with the help of technology, of course, the help of the machine learning, the help of data, the help of uh, artificial intelligence, and all of this will be part to improve a better life and happiness to our citizens. This pandemic crisis is something that make us human and we are committed, we were committed in the resolution together. And I think that we need to extend this commitment to a low carbon economy to play part in protecting our planet, our city, and this moment, more than ever, is very, is very important to, to move to this way. So we, ne we need, and in this morning someone told that, we need to make it happen. We, we can force, uh, we can forget the, the work we make today, for example, can help to improve the future of the cities tomorrow, making cities more resilient and sustainable and driving to the green economy and supporting and creating new jobs, new opportunities, retain talent, helping SMEs and citizens. At the moment, we don't know the answers and all potential paths. And I believe that the MNO is truly really exciting. We can learn. But as I said, the challenges are nearby. And it's not just the territories, the cities and the countries that make the difference. It's the development model. It's the governance model. And it's the involvement of people. The human scale. And it will be with these last ones, the people that want to make difference in the better future. And just to finish, and uh, I think that is uh, a curiosity of, uh, of Gaia, and you probably, probably don't know, is that in 1704, the first wine in the world to be bottled and commercialized in all the world, it was the Porto wine. We are just in the city with the sellers of, of Porto wine that send the Porto wine to the world. And so if in 1704, we were able to be innovate and make something different, I believe that more than 300 years later, we can innovate once again, and share technology, information, and knowledge to build the future, building a resilient and prosperous future. And, and, and now, just to finish, the world, Europe, our countries, and our cities, and I believe our future depends on the way, on, depends of the way and the time 
we accept the challenge and the opportunity to build a different and sustainable and an inclusive world. With our current knowledge, it could be absolute madness in not taking steps to a climate neutral cities. This is not type, time to keep thinking without action, it's time to action. And of course, you are all invited to visit Guy and share experience because we want to act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio, very much indeed. Lovely to hear your plans again. We had the opportunity to speak before and I'm more convinced every time I hear you. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to pick up two things. One is we can't wait because there's no time left. I don't think yeah. I think that's the take message from Glasgow that we don't know what's going to be necessary to get to 1.5 degrees really and therefore there is no time to wait and the cities that are ready to move really must move now and I think also there will be first mover advantages um, as I mentioned there's a lot of um, external finance out there floating around looking for a place to land and the first cities in this pool will um, I, I think I can't be sure I mean we're all experimenting here uh, have have uh, clear and net advantages. Um, we will do our very best. Uh, some questions in the chat, and I've tried, I, I was rudely trying to answer some of them because I've heard your presentation before. And uh, 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 so I, I took the liberty to try to answer some of the questions in the chat. I mean, I, I hope this program succeeds and becomes bigger and stronger and we can bring in more and more cities. But I, strictly speaking, I'm, I, I have instructions to find 100 and to work with them. So if you want to be in, get in. Of course, we want to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Fabian, I don't uh, don't think Jan, Jan is back. Would you like to, to, to conduct the next thing, which I think is where we turn to, to question and, and answers? Yeah, the, the idea is to have a direct uh, exchange now. Uh, do some of you want to take the floor? Where can we see that? Did someone? Put a sign in. No, not yet. Oh. Well, there's been lots of questions and comments. In Maybe the chat, wants to jump in yeah. and raise their hand may, and jump in. May I say that uh, I, I read it quickly. Uh, um, several times we can see the question about um, what happens if a city wants to get involved, but the region and the country are not in favor or are not supportive, and maybe. May I ask a question, uh, for example, for Polish and Hungarian cities, as you may know, the government is helping more the cities that are led by peace mayor for the Poland and the Fidesz in, in Hungary. Uh, how could uh, other uh, cities not led by mayors that are part of uh, uh, the national government majority uh, take Part of that, uh, for example, in Mo Poland, the, ma the main cities are not uh, peace. Uh, the mayors are not a member of the peace. So that can be a, a major issue in terms of um, uh, being able to, uh, to get to the target and also politically to be more fair, to make it possible for everyone to have access, even though we have this question of Italy, liberal uh, governments in some of our member states, unfortunately. But more globally, it can be also the case that regions are not considering it as a priority in this um, in this context, at least not uh, as high as necessary to be one of the hundred that are chosen by the commission. So please. It's a great point, uh, uh, Madam Keller, Fabian, if I may. I, I think it's right on the money. And we've tried to address that in the design of the program. So once again, cities do not need the approval or the blessing of their regions or their governments in coming forward. And, and that's important. And for also similar reasons, the contracts that we envisage to be signed, these memorandums of understanding, which each city would do, would not need to be co-signed by their national governments or their regions. That said, I very recognize, because I've talked to a lot of the mayors, and I, I'm not a politician and I'm not going to wade into the politics. I've talked to a lot of the mayors in the situations you described. It is difficult. And what I hope will emerge from this is that as the cities elaborate their plans with us, so if they come forward and express their interest, as they, as they elaborate their plans and they 
uh, and indeed they show how much of the burden of the mitigation they're going to take on their backs. I'm not wanting to hide that this is going to be a challenge for the cities. It's going to be heavy. It's going to be expensive. And I hope that the countries involved would start to say, well, hang on a minute. These cities are doing a large part of our work. Does it make sense to stand in the way or does it make sense to encourage them and to, to, to fund them? Now, I, I, I'm not naive. I know this is quite a tricky uh, area to get into, but I do hope and believe that this, this process will sh be so beneficial from all sorts of perspectives um, that it will come on board. The other point about you made about the regions is very good. Um, it, it, it may, I think the regions sometimes worry that, oh, this is going to be even more money going to the cities and less money for us. We've got to avoid it being seen as a zero-sum game. If a city does this right, for example, on mobility, it'll be thinking about the impact on the regional people who come into the city to work or shop or whatever it is. Um, and, and the city itself will depend on, on the region sometimes to provide uh, its, its carbon sink, to provide its support. And so uh, uh, cities shouldn't feel atomized um, and, and should really try to elaborate their plans as much as possible with regions and member states. We're there to help. We're also, I should have said, spending a bit more of Horizon Europe's money on plans to develop national networks. So some great national networks already existing in, in Sweden, for example, the Viable Cities Network in Austria, in Greece, in Spain. Spain's done incredible things. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm missing anybody out there, but you know we want to see these networks really growing um, and uh, a, a support network, if you like, for the cities doing this. Sorry to be a bit long, but it's a very important point you make. Yes, uh, thank you, Matthew. And, oh, hi, yeah, uh, great. Okay. And uh, because we have a, a lot of questions on the chat, but I see that uh, one of the participants uh, uh, wants to take the, because this is raising hands. I don't know. I, uh, no, it disappeared. I think. The, the, oh no, Charles Carey um, wants to 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 ask the floor. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, look, I'm not a city and I've made several comments in the chat about the private sector, which Matthew um, referred to, the importance of it. Um, I was excited by Matthew's response saying that you're not looking for cities with full business plans. And I do think as expressions of interest come forward, if there's any way you could sort of um, make a platform for sort of last minute, innovative, disruptive ideas. Uh, I think COP26 demonstrated just what a stranglehold the car industry have on the transport agenda. And I know transport's only part of Mission Cities. Um, yes, there were a lot of conversations in the cycling and the public, uh, public transport lobby, but we really still need to push push the boundaries for innovative thinking. And, I, and I, I, I fear the cities might fall into the trap of business as usual as they put forward their ideas. So if you could create a forum for, for either a meet and greet or, or some pitch. Um, so let's say there's 200 cities now just finalizing their expressions of interest. If there's any space for, for some last minute ideas, which just whet the appetite of the EU when they see those bids. Thank you. Yes, Matthew, can you just react if you want, please? Yeah, I mean, just, just, just two things there that you asked in the, in the chat, Charles, whether we would make all the expression of interest public. I, again, I will have to check, but I don't think it's up to the commission to be making public the plans of the cities unless the cities expressly want that to happen. Uh, so that's the first sort of more technical point. The second point about the involvement of the private sector. Um, I mean, I hope the cities will be working with their local private sectors um, and pulling on all private sector levers when they come forward. Again, you know, everyone's going to have to be involved in this. And look at the examples of the cities that are planning to do this. So a couple of great examples are Leuven and Aarhus in, in Denmark, where the private sector is bound in or bound in is joined in with all the activities that they're doing to become climate neutral. Um, I, I'm open to this idea of a forum. I mean, but I, I, I think of this. Um, I think my answer there would be to empower the consortium that's doing it, the mission platform, the net zero cities to do that. They're very keen to bring in innovative private thinking, um, and I think they're as concerned as everyone else that we don't um, we, we don't try to play golf with one club. I mean, as I said in Glasgow, you know. Uh, electrification of vehicles is one part of the answer towards the climate neutrality of transport, but it's by no means the only part of the answer. And I'm glad that the final resolution 
uh, on transport reflected some of those broader solutions. We've got to think about all creative things together. Thank you. And to, uh, uh, yes, any reaction from? No, it's okay. So, um, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, Matthew, we don't have any other uh, participants who want to take the floor personally, but we have a lot of questions um, on the chat. So, we will be so kind to look at the chat. If there are some questions, you can answer immediately as some of them on the written form, if it's, if it's possible, please. Absolutely happy to do that. But I mean, if I miss your question, that would be a great moment because we do have a bit more time. Raise your hand and and tell me you speak to it in person. And uh, and of course, if you're not happy with the reply I've given, um, maybe I'll, I'll work backwards up through the question. So <laughs> more recent first. Question from Ingo Felscher. Is a cooperation with NGOs planned, which have the goal of speeding up the plans of climate neutrality in their country cities? If yes, in which step could they be involved? In Germany, there's German Zero, which supports currently 60 local citizens initiatives with the goal of climate neutrality 2030 or 2035 in their cities in discussion with their cities. Well, the wonderful thing about these kinds of events is you learn something new. I didn't know about German Zero before. Um, so Ingo, please get in touch. Um, that sounds like a great, uh, what I call helpful pressure um, from NGOs on cities, as I use helpful pressure all the time in my job to try to you know, keep nudging policy in the, in the right direction. We're not planning a formal cooperation with NGOs. It's a bit like the answer to the private sector, because NGOs will have to be engaged at each step of the way. When I was recently in Hamburg, I had a, I had a dinner with representatives and the NGOs about the plans, and the ideas flowed. And from that has come, for example, the idea to have uh, a, a bit of a cooperation between three of the different missions involved on adaptation and port cities and on climate mitigation involving the NGOs to try to maximize the advantages from a city perspective in the different mission plans. I mean, that's just one idea. Um, uh, Lervin, um, I'm sorry to keep quoting Lervin, but it's close to home and it's uh, some very good vivid examples, actually established an NGO and brought it within the city hall to keep the contacts up between the voluntary sector and the different citizens groups uh, uh, and, and a, as a good and effective channel to get those citizens views plugged into the city's thinking. There are lots of different ways of doing this. And once again, I really want to underline, we not in the commission, I'm not saying this is how you have to do it. We want the engagement of everyone. And in the first instance, it's for the cities to decide how they're doing it. Citizens' engagement in Napoli is going to be very different from how it would be in Bratislava and very different again from Turku. So yeah, this, this, is, this is my message on this one. Um, I'm not going, am I working backwards? Um, is it possible for cities uh, from the UK to apply to the program? Well, Horizon Europe is open to all uh, associated countries involved in the process. This is in the statutes of, of the of Horizon Europe. And um, uh, so, so that's a, a factual state. And that, of course, involves a lot of um, uh, countries, uh, neighboring countries to Europe. I note that some of the association um, negotiations are ongoing. And, and, and so that process is, is um, uh, out of my hands. Um, and um, but I mean, that's the, 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 the Horizon Europe program is, uh, is the Horizon Europe program and, and involves and engages with associated countries as well. Um, I'm just picking up further questions. Uh, Flor, Flor de Jong has helpfully put in the chat the her, uh, email address, and there's an opportunity for you to come directly to the city of Groningen with questions or suggestions, which is great. Um, I think I've answered Charles's points. I've answered Piotr's question and Stefan's question. Um, I've answered Sofia's question, I did quite well. Um, but I, again, I'm looking, Jan, if you see somebody wants to come in and raise their hand, I think- I'm checking all the time yeah. if anybody wants to take the floor. So if it's anybody uh, raised hand, uh, I will let you know, but so, uh, at the same time, if there are any other uh, uh, answers, please do. I see a question coming from Alexandra Doring. Um, several European universities from the EU European Universities Initiatives, E+, and Horizon SWAF's uh, 2020 funding have included their cities, university cities, as associated partners. Can universities participate with their cities? Underline three times, yes. It's a brilliant idea. Uh, and a number of cities are doing that. 
And again, it, it reinforces and underlines the innovation message. Um, some of the most living of living labs um, and most vivid of city experimentation has been conducted by universities and by local universities. Again, Leuven's a great example of that. I had the honor to meet some of the um, some of the people from the universities I working, for example, in, in, in Hamburg when I was recently visiting there. So unequivocally, yes, this is this makes perfect sense, um, and indeed uh, can often speed the way towards climate neutrality. To to you, if the when we or when you can expect the first list of the cities. Um, well, if all goes if it all goes to to plan, um, we will be out with that list in um, somewhere between March and April. It, again, it, it a lot will depend on how much interest there is. I mean, if we got um, if we got 100 uh, uh, um, clear expressions of interest um, for, for being climate neutral by 2030, it's not going to be a difficult task. If we get 300, it's going to be a very difficult task. If we get 50, we have a different type of issue there. Um, so. I, I really can't answer how quickly we'll be able to get it out, but I very much hope we'll be able to answer and, and provide some feedback in, in March, April. I see, I see Bernard Gerhardt has uh, his hand up. Maybe we could give him the floor. Uh, thanks for the possibility to uh, let me state. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, for me, a very uh, um, important fact is uh, to understand the uh, the heating sector, the decarbonization of the heating sector uh, should be understood as the uh, sleeping giant of decarbonization of the energy system. And apart from, of course, I appreciate actions in cycling and uh, car sharing and transport uh, sector, but uh, please have a focus on decarbonization of the heating sector. And I don't want to make advertisement for my company. <laughs> Solid, <laughs> but uh, no. All all the cities uh, that uh, participate in this uh, call uh, have a look on your uh, uh, on on your heating system. Thanks. Yes, uh, but before giving the floor to Matthew, but am I wrong? Or we, you are touching the uh, the most? I mean, a uh, 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 hot issue now. This is the new ETS. Uh, revision, which is uh, which will be about the heating systems as well. So I think this is something which is coming in a very, 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 very emotional way. But Matthew, uh, I agree with you the floor. Well, thank you to both for those points. I mean, yes, it's another good example of the macro and the micro. Sorry to answer your question. Absolutely, energy. <laughs> um, uh, heating, uh, buildings efficiency is central to this. We're covering all sectors, not just transport. I'm sorry if I gave that impression. Heating, buildings, heating, cooling, waste, wastewater treatments, all of that's involved. Um, and the point you just made, Jan, uh, if you like, there's a macro element to this, which is what we handled with European legislation. Um, the, the, the new legislation coming forward on buildings, by the way, all the legislation coming forward on, on, on different aspects of energy, all of that, if you like, the macro way of delivering the Fit for 55, the European Green Deal. You mentioned that there are plans afoot to look at how we can integrate road transport and also buildings into the ETS system. And that's that's also another macro element. Um, uh, and as you also said, politically sensitive and, um, uh, you know, these are touchy subjects. Um, my response is that, again, to look at it then from the city perspective, all the way back to what their own needs are. If as a city, you've got um, a, 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 a ready and available source of renewable energy, um, you're, you live in a particularly windy place, or, or you've got uh, ready access to geothermal, um, you might be wanting to put more emphasis on the supplying of renewable energy to your buildings, rather than on the renovation of the building stock to make them more efficient. Um, other cities without such easy access to renewables, for example, may say we're going to put more of our emphasis on the renovation of the building stock. Both of them are difficult uh, and challenging undertakings. Both of them require quite big structural changes to cities to do so. Some of the cities that have got already district heating systems in place, such as Copenhagen's a good example of that, where they have been using for some time uh, access you know, they, they, and they've moved their district's heating system source of energy from coal to biomass. And now they're thinking again about how to move 
off, off biomass as that becomes more difficult. Um, you've got, if you like, the system that you've got the plumbing in place, and then you're you're plugging in different uh, energy sources, and this this gives an advantage. The key thing here again is financing for me. Um, there are some very interesting ways in which different cities are able to finance, um, particularly the renovation of the building stock. Uh, um, uh, I better not name the city because they haven't. I'm not sure how public they are, but they, for example, have set up a revolving fund which involves 25 million first loss, um, which has generated a 250 million uh, influx of funds. And with that, they're going to renovate their entire building stock by 2030, around quarter of a million homes. This is the kind of far-sighted creative thinking um, using the, the finance that's out there, plugging in, uh, reassuring that finance that um, there's, there's ways of managing it. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not the greatest energy energy expert, uh, not only uh, in the commission, but in this room probably. So I just want to signal that we're open to all different kinds of ways of, of tackling this. Yeah, but uh, Matthew, I think that uh, uh, we stop by, step by step, we are go a little bit broader than the mission itself, because you are now <laughs> answering the question about the uh, EU energy policy in general. I mean, the 50 or 55, et cetera. So I think that it's, it's, it shows how important the element is and how important the, the mission is, because this is something which is uh, uh, probably one of the elements, but the people, they have so many doubts. And when you look at the chat, I think this is the first, this is the proposal coming from Charles Curry. It's, it's to us. Uh, we can send the uh, mail to participants. They have to share to mails to be shared. Of course, we can do it. And the, uh, uh, from Daniel Schultz, I think this is a very interesting question. If you if you be so kind and look at it, because this is about the definition of urban climate neutrality. And at the end, does it mean that these emissions uh, um, uh, of electricity from power plants within or with outside city boundaries uh, uh, should be measured, but not considered uh, in the evaluation of the climate neutrality is reached or not? I think this is really, very, very interesting. By the way, my comment is that probably the, the answers to the questions can give you the um, uh, uh, food for thought to uh, before the meeting with the Committee of Regions, I think, because to avoid this kind of questions. So I think this is extremely interesting. So how, what is your reaction to this? Well, we're not looking to avoid any questions. We're doing our best to answer all of them. <laughs> uh, but um, just before I come on to Daniel Schultz's question, uh, which is one of the last ones in the chat, if colleagues would like to have a look at it, you're right about um, it's dragging us, the mission, into lots of different elements of commission policy. And you mentioned energy, there's transport, there's a the circular economy, there's all the work going on on air pollution, there's all the work going on in digital and smart. And, and, and of course, it, it brings in regional policy, which is why it's so important that we have a broad base within the commission and we have a, a team, it's a very small team, I wish it was bigger, working uh, with colleagues from ENA, from, from the JRC, from MOVE, and we're, we're looking to expand that. And if I may toss the tennis ball gently to your side of the net, Jan, is, I think it's great if you can bring in as many colleagues with interest from the different European Parliament committees. Um, and not just, if you like, the urban side or the research side, but, uh, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned, of course we have, um, colleagues from research and innovation at in, the in heart of our team. Um, but but you know, to, to build a broad church of support in the parliament for this initiative and other urban initiatives is, is, is so important for us. Uh, and, and we need to get urban policy out of its, uh, out of its corner and, and really embrace all these broader elements. But I'm talking not to avoid Daniel's question. Um, the, um, in the info kit, we have defined indeed climate neutrality as essentially scope one and scope two emissions. That is direct, emissions within a city, and also, uh, and that is of course from emissions of electricity within and outside boundaries, but also indirect and indirect emissions within the city boundary from heating and cooling uh, uh, and so forth. Um, just quick parenthesis, we are thereby excluding scope three emissions, meaning the, uh, for example, every time I make a, a call on my mobile phone, I generate a carbon charge somewhere outside Brussels. Um, if I buy uh, meat from Argentina, that has embodied carbon in it. So we're not asking cities to try to capture those very difficult and sensitive elements. We are interested, back to the innovation thing, of working with cities on how to measure them in the future, not requiring them to include that in their climate neutral targets by 2030, 
but we are going to have to address these eventually by 2050. Um, uh, so um, again, back to this mission as a way of testing some of the most difficult ways of capturing uh, carbon and climate neutral emissions. Um, I, I'm going to have to take um, a, a check back with you, Daniel, on the interaction between what we're saying uh, under the technical definition of climate neutrality and the information that you're right, we put in the power plants and industrial facilities under the emission scheme are not uh, considered. Um, and, and I will get back to you with the technical answer on, on whether or not therefore cities have to include this in, in the valuation of, of, of climate neutrality. I'm slightly outside my technical uh, knowledge there and I want to give you a precise answer. So we'll come back to you on that one. Sorry, I'm just looking if any uh, of our participants wants uh, to take the floor. I don't know, Matthew, if you have some additional remarks concerning the chat or, or we can make the conclusions and to, to leave it to the written answer if there is something. And of course, if you can uh, uh, leave your code, oh, I can see the, uh, 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 the hand which is raised. Just a moment. Uh, I think it's an old hand. I think it was the hand from Bernard, unless he wants to. Come oh, back. right. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, so if, if it's not the case, and if you, if you have some additional comments on chat now, if not, we will make the conclusions. Uh, so, Matthew, what is your suggestion? Well, if I one procedural suggestion, if we still have a few more minutes, maybe to ask Philippe Roxma and Antonio Castro if they'd like to come back in, both in response to the things they've seen on the chat and my responses to things they've seen on the chat. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not mandatory at all. And maybe uh, you feel you've said everything you wanted to say, but I think you both gave very living examples from opposite ends of Europe of why you felt the mission was important. And, and maybe you'd like to comment on what you've heard with your permission, Jan. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I think this is the, uh, when we discuss the general European policy elements and the mission, etc. the question is, uh, uh, so, sorry, but the, as a former mayor, I'm, I, I'm absolutely to read the question to our uh, co colleagues coming from concrete places. Do you think that it's feasible? I mean, this is uh, uh, a little bit provocative. I mean, the uh, feasible in, te in terms of neutrality, etc. So uh, I, I share the view, please. Uh, I, we give it the floor to two other panelists. Who, who wants to take the floor, please? I see if I may, um, yes. If yep. I may, uh, Matthew and Jan. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Matthew, for all the answers and uh, about the discussion. And um, well, you started in one way. Uh, how many re uh, re the reasons to have to 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 do the energy transition is about children and grandchildren. Um, but then uh, I would say, if it's not for them, do it for the money. Yeah, just uh, insulate your houses and uh, lower your energy bill and and uh, do that for that reason or do it to prevent earthquakes or do it pre to prevent uh, to to counter geopolitical reasons like uh, the, the the rising energy prices uh, how many reasons do you need to go for the for the energy transition and uh, so politically in Groningen that's it's a it's a clear answer we need to do that we need it as quickly as possible how realistic is it to, to to speed up the to speed up the process? We want to have to do that. It's also a social dimension, as I said, um, uh, the, between the haves and the have-nots. Who those who can insulate, who those who can uh, uh, put solar panels on their on the rooftop, uh, those who and those who cannot, and those who, who need to be helped or supported or uh, uh, financially by financial means or whatever uh, by the government by the local government and by us uh, i think that is that's a, that's essential to understand that and that also explains our urgency um so maybe it's not the question can we or but the question is uh, do we have to and the, the answer is a full yes and we cannot say to our citizens like uh, your turn is like in 20 years or in 25 years or in 30 years it's your turn to be uh, to be helped by the government and then uh, at that time you'll have district heating or whatever uh, uh, we have to act now in our lifetime and it's not only for our children and grandchildren it's also for us uh, so to speak so that's our uh, essential something else uh, and that's uh, the uh, um, mentioned by Fabienne Keller is the uh, is the, the the public space the livable space and the air pollution and the traffic 
as I mentioned, I'm also in, in mobility. That's also my theme. And we look at mobility, let's say, from a different angle, like in the past, from the, the past decades. It used to be like we, we need, there's mobility, there's, there's car traffic, and we need to uh, uh, provide them with enough space. Uh, now we, we look at it exactly the other way around. There's public space, which has all kinds of functions, like uh, 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 playgrounds for children and people to meet, but all, uh, climate adaptation and so on, and also mobility. So mobility has to find a place in that public space, but it's not the first, uh, like, uh, like we start with mobility and then the rest has, has to find its place. Now we start with the public space, uh, which should be a livable space, and then mobility has to play a role in it. So we, we look at it, uh, it's, a, it's a paradigm shift from looking at, at mobility. And uh, as she also mentioned, uh, it's, it's great for Mark Matthew, it's not a climate neutral city, it's also smart cities. And we use intelligence, we use data, we use uh, technology uh, to help us. And technology actually is on our side. There's new technology improvements, new inventions, new techniques to help us to, to deal with the climate neutrality, with carbon neutrality and mobility. And uh, smart cities will help us to reach our goals. Um, as we are growing, and uh, uh, I, I pointed out our interest in, uh, uh, we'll definitely uh, submit um, uh, our expression of interest. Uh, and we're, uh, we, uh, Flora de Jong, so one of my uh, helpers, uh, gave her email address. So if you have any questions, any of the other cities, so how do you look at this? How uh, can you help us? What is your perspective? Uh, how do you look at this, uh, at the issue of climate neutrality, carbon neutrality? Uh, we are willing to help any of the other cities in, in um, reaching our goals and reaching their goals because it's, it's for the benefit of us all. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, do, uh, can, can you ask the Antonio uh, the, for, for also for giving his remarks? Okay, so if it's not if it's not possible anymore, yes, uh, Matthew. Oh no, no, no Antonio no, is here. Hello, is here. Sorry. Okay. Yes, Antonio, oh. please close yours. Aprons. I have some problems because I don't. Have we sound. can we can hear you, Antonio. Go ahead. Sorry, I will try. Jan Jombucic now. So, okay, Antonio, you can turn on your micro, please, because it was okay before. I think he's okay. now it's okay. Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Uh, hello. hello. But I can't listen. I don't know why. Uh, it's okay now. It's okay now. Let please oh. go. Okay, I, I think people need to, <clears throat> to understand our commitment. Uh, as I said uh, in my presentation, the human scale, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm technical. At the moment, I'm the president of the board of a public company, so my approach is more political. But uh, I think that the main issue is the, the human scale, as I said. Uh, we need to, to understand, the people need to understand the political commitment, the, the commitment of the city the goals, the benefits, and more than words, we have to start to act in the mobility, for example. We start to, to in a big project, for example, in between Porto and Gaia to build a new bridge. And we, when we think in the new bridge, uh, we think in a bridge for the public transport and for bikes and for uh, people walk, not for cars. So I think it's a, a new message to, to, to the people, uh, because if we made a, a, a bridge to cars, they probably the people don't understand, okay, they are talking about climate neutral and smart cities, but they put a, a new bridge with cars. So I think that the, our words have to match with our actions. And uh, this is an example, for example, um, of our approach in mobility. Uh, in, in the energy, we have a lot of um, 
living labs in our territory. As I said, we have uh, there's there are, there is a, a larger territory. Gaia is uh, a big a big city, and and so uh, we are trying to do that. We are in a moment that we 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 are making uh, the revision of our local plan, and we listen to the people the people. Uh, the people needs um, and uh, in my presentation i said that the people want to 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 maintain the tradition and the customs but they want to be they they, they want to have a smart city but they need uh, the traditional things so i think this this match uh, in, in a whole city like gaia i don't know if you know gaia but but it's a, a an old city it's a, a challenge, um, and so I think we are on the way. For example, I can give you another. Uh, Matthew said in in this presentation that in the way to climate and neutral uh, city, we need to be smart. Um, and so, for example, at the moment, we are implementing the building information modeling for urban municipality approvals. So it's not only to take uh, time, but uh, to analyze the life cycle of the buildings, uh, uh, the life cost of the buildings, uh, the uh, circular economy. So I think that we have a lot of ways to, to go to the climate and neutral uh, smart cities. And we are in some of them, but we want to, to accept the challenge, as I said, as a city, the president, want to, to accept the challenge. So we are working on that. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank, you. thank you for the answer, because me as a politician, I absolutely share your view. That's why it's my provo provocative question about feasibility. Visibility is not about technical technology. Technolo technologically, everything yeah. is possible. Yeah. The, question, the question is, what, what about the people's, I mean, the, the acceptance of, of the citizens for the solutions? So I think it's not yeah. only political will of politicians. But the yeah. political will should be uh, reflected by the will of the people. If if not, no technology will help. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's why I think a lot of things to be done. And I think that the mission should be one of the steps to do it. I mean, the mission, which is not the, the technological element. This is the the question: how to introduce some way of thinking. I think that sorry, it's just to to to, to say one thing. I, I think that mainly we have uh, and for example in our teams we have people from engineering. We are we have architects. We have uh, um, economics economists, but we don't have people who knows psychologists. For example, people that knows to how to reach to the people. Um, and we are trying to input uh, a new approach because we need that uh, the, the, the connection between the people to the city, the technology to the city. It's one of the, the, the big challenges that we have in the in this future. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so uh, uh, Matthew, uh, yes, the floor is yours. Just, just very quickly, um, I, can, I can be very short because I just agree profoundly with what Philippe said and Antonio said and what you just said, Jan. Is it feasible? It's the right challenging question. The answer to that is yes, because we've seen cities with existing plans which are working and we're seeing cities now come forward with new plans which add up. And you're right, Tayan, it, uh, uh, it is technically and financially challenging, but the essence of this is politics, which is why it's such a fascinating project and why uh, it needs that leadership of mayors to get there. But I would just say this, yes. if cities, go for it and fall short, there aren't consequences. There aren't legal consequences. Um, cities will in any case have improved their emissions. They will have improved their livable and lovable cities as Philip said. Um, so I, I would say that's a reason to be bold. And I would say to pick up Philip's point about the children and the grandchildren and, and not forgetting the money either. If, you, if we don't try, if cities don't try, there will be consequences. There'll be consequences for all of us. Yeah. Um, and consequences for our cities. One of my favorite cartoons of all time is in The New Yorker, and it has two old white guys like me in their suits, and they're standing in front of a city square, as much as Philippe described, where the children are playing and the birds are singing and people are having a great time. And they're saying to each other, but you know, 
what happens if this climate change stuff isn't for real and we've done all these changes for nothing? Um, which is an ironic way of pointing out that we can get massive things done for cities regardless of the global challenge, but isn't it nice we've got the global challenge to really go on our consciences if we don't? Thank you. All right, so uh, so <coughs> if you allow me, because the, uh, I see that uh, some of the participants, uh, we will leave our meeting because this is more than uh, almost two hours, which is for the webinars uh, quite a lot. I would like to thank you. And I uh, just just not to repeat, but uh, for the short conclusion, I think this is, uh, for me, two uh, uh, important elements. One, what you said at the beginning is that uh, uh, this is the kind of label a label which will um, uh, unblock some things. So I think this is a very important uh, element that the, this initiative has a, a special goal. Secondly, how to avoid the, um, what uh, uh, Professor Gage Vaz said, how to avoid the, the sea losses in the European policies. I think this is, and of course for me, uh, it's a question uh, uh, this missions, like the other elements, very interesting and innovative. Uh, they they are interesting and important if there is a follow up. I mean, if this is a the uh, the sharing the experience, if it's sent to the city, etc. Because you know there are so many interesting things which are uh, which are closed and next. They, they are in the history of the institution. So I, I think that this is worth thinking about the follow-up now and to prepare the, the way of the, the, uh, sharing the experience in, 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 after the, when the mission is even over. So, uh, uh, so I would like to think, and I would like to say to all the participants that we, we, we uh, registered the, uh, the whole meeting. It will be on the YouTube. So please, if you can uh, uh, share it with the other, uh, I mean, with the city's uh, authorities and people interested, uh, it will be really good, uh, uh, very important to, to use the information and the debate and extremely interesting questions to, to distribute it among, among the others. And of course, I hope, and this is, uh, uh, I think what Matthew said, that I hope that probably uh, half of next year we will be back uh, and we would like to ask you what, what about the, the, the uh, first results of, of the mission. So I think that um, uh, uh, this is promised and uh, uh, let's uh, uh, see uh, uh, next time in some months. But for a moment, uh, stay health because this is, this is important uh, in uh, this situation. And, uh, and I would like to invite you to our next meeting. So Matthew, thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Tony, and uh, uh, thank you all the participants. As you as you noticed, the, uh, during two uh, two hours, we had almost uh, uh, more than one hundred people uh, present, which is uh, which is important for this kind of webinars. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Next time. Thank you.